Welcome back to In the Arena. I'm your host, Jonathan Stein. We're talking to young alums of the Goldman School of Public Policy, UC Berkeley, about the huge impact they're having on their policy fields. They are quite literally in the arena. Today's guest is Emily Mazakarati, the CEO and founder of 427, a company that provides customized tools blending climate science and economic modeling to clients that range from local governments to major corporations. From 2007 to 2012, Emily was the head of carbon analysis at Thomson Reuters Point Carbon. She's published extensively on California climate policy, corporate adaptation, and carbon markets. She is a visiting lecturer at the UC Davis Graduate School of Management. Welcome, Emily. The question you must get most often is, what does 427 mean? What's the name of your company? The name refers to California's greenhouse gas emission reduction target for 2020. So it actually is 427 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is the level of carbon emissions California was at back in 1990 and that it's aiming to go back to back in 2020 under climate legislation AB 32. As I'm sure you're aware, that target has now been uh, superseded by a 2030 target under SB 32, <laughs> <laughs> SB 350. Um, so it is both a legacy from my work on carbon markets and climate policy, uh -huh. where we are striving to reach goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also uh, a sort of a, a, a nod to the uh, data and quantitative focus that the firm has, and the challenges of working on science and policy, which are constant moving targets. 427 bridges the gap between climate science and the people out there who need climate science. Um, so instead of telling somebody, uh, hey, the earth is going to warm two degrees Celsius, you're providing your clients with a range of concrete impacts climate change is going to have on their business or on their community, right? Um, do you find that you're able to make concrete something that people um, desperately need but otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, decipher? There's a lot of challenges, uh, but there's also growing awareness and recognition that we need to understand better this data and what it means for decisions today. Um, some of the main challenges that we face when we talk about climate change are the time scale. How far out in the future are we going to see those impacts? Who cares what's going to happen in 2050 when you're making business decisions or policy decisions today? And um, so that's one of the main challenges. The second challenge that we see is uh, the scale. Climate models typically provide data um, in the range of 100 square kilometers, which is also not very useful for decision making. So making climate data concrete for decisions today is uh, definitely challenging. So the, the three main things are the time scale, the, um, the geographic scale and then the, uh, the availability of the data. And so climate models have been available and publicly available for a long time now. The science dates back 20, 30 years. There is, outside of the US at least, but even in the US, a broad recognition of the reality of climate change and its impact mm -hmm. on our economic and social and human systems, let alone ecosystems, of course but it hasn't really been used effectively for decision making. And so um, when I found it for 27, that was really my, uh, my assumption and my thesis going into the space, which is there's a lot of data out there that is not being used for decision making. So what's going on here and what can we do and what can I do coming into this uh, question as a non-scientist? How can I help get the data out of the scientists' hands almost and into decision makers' hands? Right. You described 427 as a mission-driven company uh, because the data analysis that you provide to companies about how climate change will impact their workforce or their assets, their facilities, or what have you, um, leads to private sector preparedness, and private sector preparedness leads to community resilience to climate change. 
Connect those dots for us. Yes, there might be a few shortcuts in, <laughs> in that <laughs> description, so let me make sure I can get that. So first, 427 is very much from my standpoint a social enterprise in the sense that anything that helps people better understand climate change, better prepare for climate change, but also by better understanding impact, maybe be a little more motivated to prevent <laughs> further impacts and, and greater uh, changes in the climate, uh, has social, is, is a public good in a way. Um, that said, we are a for-profit corporation and we make money out of our clients as a consulting firm and as a, as a software provider. We, I came in being focused on the private sector because I very much saw that as a missing piece of the of the conversation. Um, back in fall 2012, I had quit my corporate job mm -hmm. and was looking at the space and uh, Hurricane Sandy hit New York. And I saw businesses, to the most powerful businesses on earth, the New York Stock Exchange, Goldman Sachs, a lot of those facilities losing the ability to conduct business for days in a row, which is highly unusual. And I was shocked by how unprepared they were, but also really intrigued by the interplay between what local, what local businesses could do to help the local community get back on its feet. And that went from local cafes who had just power extensions out there, plugged into their generator and saying, you know, come have a cup of coffee and charge your cell phone, yeah. all the way to uh, Goldman Sachs and many other corporations that sent their workers in the street to help clean up the street. And so for me, it was the realization that while governments were talking about adaptation and increasingly paying attention, the private sector was not. And without the private sector, we weren't going to be in a place where we were sufficiently prepared and we were missing on a lot of resources to make us better prepared as a society. Because so much of climate risk is, is really big risk, like destabilization of socioeconomic systems, for example, like that sort of big risk. Um, you describe it in uh, some of your past work as outside the fence, outside the control, right, of a, of a corporation's, um, or outside of a, a corporation's direct control. Your work ends up making the case that private sector resources should be brought to these larger societal problems and brought to the, to the purpose of serving communities. Yeah, I see it really as a two-way interaction. If corporations don't pay attention to communities, A, they're much more exposed because they're not islands. <laughs> they depend on goods and services and people coming in and out. They depend on infrastructure, power, telecom, uh, water, you name it, right? Everything that we depend on to function, businesses also do. And so if they ignore what's happening outside of their fence, they're probably much more exposed and vulnerable than they are within the confine of their actual uh, parcel. But there is also a, a missed opportunity in a way when, when local governments don't engage with businesses because those businesses want those infrastructure and systems to be functioning and they may have resources and I, I have a client right now where we're having this conversation, are you going to just put you know, sandbags or seawall around your campus? Or are you going to work with the local community, with the other businesses, so that we don't end up with a bunch of fortress businesses and everybody else around it underwater? Right. And maybe everybody's better off with one big common protection. And oh, by the way, this common protection, which can be partly funded by the private sector, also helps protect the poorer communities that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it. Right, so I think that example of sandbags is a perfect way to make concrete for viewers and, and listeners, exactly the sort of thing you enable to do through the tools you provide to companies. What's, what's another example or what are other kinds of examples um, of things that you can illuminate for corporations um, so that they can take action effectively. Yes, and it's it's interesting because there is a lot of demand for stories right now and case studies and examples yeah. because a lot of people who are starting to pay attention then turn around and say, help me convince my boss, my constituents, you, my clients, you name it. Um, so we actually wrote a number of case studies of, of corporate adaptation and uh, responsible corporate adaptation. And um, I think one of the, the powerful and, and very relevant case studies is looking at the supply chain for a lot of companies, specifically in the food and beverage sector, but not only, but to take an example of uh, in the food sector, um, Mars, not to name them, <laughs> um, who depends, uh, who is one of the main providers uh, and 
one of the main uh, retailers of uh, rice in the world, not okay. just uh, chocolate bars, <laughs> but <laughs> okay. Uncle Ben's, anyway. Okay. Um, so large food company with an extensive supply chain in, uh, with smallholder farmers in Pakistan, in India, cocoa producers in West Africa. They are having this kind of project with the supplier. So it's not their business, but they need the suppliers to deliver the good. And if they have this knowledge as a large multinational corporation based in the US that works with UC Davis of all places to better understand impacts on long-term agricultural from climate change, they have this visibility. They know the yields are going to go down in Pakistan. They know the water is going to be less available. The heat is going to right. uh, affect the yield. And so they're working with the farmers to uh, try a new, t new varieties of plant and new farming techniques that will help maintain or increase the yields so that they can as a corporation keep their rice supply and keep selling rice to all of us but also as a responsible corporation make sure that their suppliers don't get wiped out by right. climate change. So part of what 427 does is not just help companies protect their assets and supply chains from damage in the event of climate change events but also to identify new business opportunities. Right. Absolutely. And that's and that's really important because we talk a lot about the risk and often people can be a little uncomfortable talking about opportunities around climate change. There is an element of sure. profiteering from people's plight that nobody's really comfortable right. with. I'm sure a lot of uh, Berkeley people would have that <laughs> instinctive reaction, right? Not just Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, if you think of how our economies function, there is going to be demand for products and services to meet new needs. A very concrete example is with climate change, we're going to see a changing in the regions of the world that are affected by malaria. So we're going to have a greater need for mosquito nets in some parts of the world that don't currently need them. The pharmaceutical companies or the health products companies that are thinking about this, uh, this kind of issues are starting to see how they're going to engage those markets and sell those mosquito nets uh, in parts of the world that are going to see more and more mosquitoes carrying diseases. And so it's a market opportunity from them. New market, great. But those people are going to need the mosquito nets if they don't want to get sick. And if nobody's selling mosquito nets, they're going to get sick, right? And so there is an element of the market needs to adapt, not just because it benefits individual corporations, but also because it means the goods and services that are needed to adapt will be delivered. And that could be water efficiency um, technology, that could be microgrids. So there are opportunities, and those opportunities are also opportunities to bring new solutions that are going to be needed. So if we're talking about new markets, which means new investments, is there a role for financial institutions to play in, you know, sort of a changing, a changing world or funding the needs of a changing world? Financial institutions are the uh, latest arrived at the table, but they are arriving very forcefully, as they can sometimes do. <laughs> um, and I, I've been in this business for five years of trying to tell people in the private sector that climate change is a business concern and had mixed results uh -huh. for the better part of those five years where a lot of people will look at me and say, honey, you're crazy, what are you talking about? Um, and that has dramatically changed in the past 18 months, uh, in part due to efforts from regulators, um, central bank in the UK, the Financial Stability Board, like worldwide financial institutions and regulators saying, Markets, we have a problem. That problem is called climate change and nobody knows where the risk is, but we know there's risk somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that message has uh, come right home with a number of large financial institutions. And when I say large, I mean BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, $5 trillion under management. State Street, $3 trillion under management. Those very large financial institutions that own equity in every U.S. corporation are now coming out publicly and saying, we want to understand where the risk is in our portfolio and we need you corporations to report on that risk. We need to know that you understand the risk, that you're paying attention, that you're planning for it, and we need to see how you're doing that. And so there's going to be a huge push coming not just from regulation or for I want to from I want to do the right thing it's part of our sustainability corporate social responsibility it's a push from where it hurts from the guys who hold the money saying you now need climate change is a business issue that needs to be discussed at the highest level in the company at the board level at the C-suite level and we want to see how you do that is there 
any possibility, and I'm, I'm just literally thinking out loud as we talk, <laughs> is there any possibility that for some financial institution, they realize they make more money off of capitalizing off of climate change and its impacts and the way it changes markets than on stopping climate change and helping to ensure a world that is not sort of deeply damaged by all those impacts? Thankfully, I don't think it works that way <laughs> um, because the conversation around climate risk in the financial sector touches upon not just the physical impacts of climate change, that's really the new part of the conversation, but it also touches upon what does it mean to adjust our energy systems such that we can stop emitting as much green ga greenhouse gas emissions. And so this other part of the conversation is uh, the so-called the energy transition. Assuming that we are at some point going to have an energy transition because it is not sustainable to continue to emit this much greenhouse gas and, you know, the, the, the climate will win. Like, we, we, we don't get to win that discussion. We can, we can stall as long as we want, but we're going to lose it. Um, so at some point, there's going to have to be this transition. When is this at some point? How quickly does it happen? And the more you wait, the more brutal it is. And what does this mean, not just for all the fossil fuel production companies, all companies, coal companies, but also for the entire value chain that depends on and that uses those fossil fuels? How about the car manufacturers? How about transportation and railroad that depend on carrying oil? All those companies should be thinking about what business they're going to be in if mm. there's no more oil. And while it's it still seems very theoretical as a conversation. The coal, I mean, coal companies went bankrupt when three months before everybody said, oh no, coal, we're never getting out of coal. And so that conversation is gonna happen about oil at some point. And investors are very much looking at that and holding ExxonMobil and other large corporations accountable for, so how exactly are you planning to get out of what is currently your main business? Right, but do you see any challenges in getting a corporation like that or the investors in that corporation to focus on what the corporation will do in 20 years or in 40 years when its primary interest is the next quarter's earnings, right? I mean, Hugely, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a huge challenge and that's the main issue right now. And <clears throat> the financial systems, work around short-term reward. Quarterly reports, investors typically stay and hold a, a, a stock for maybe a year and a half top. And so there is no incentive for corporations to look further other than the research that's emerging saying, you know, actually the corporations that look out further tend to fare better mm -hmm. over the long run, but everybody wants to beat the market and get out before, uh, before things go down. So that is one of the main challenges. Um, the, the sort of the running assumption is as there is more pressure from investors and from regulators outside of the US right now to disclose this exposure to risk and therefore corporations start looking into this risk and this risk is not 20 years out. In many ways it's already happening today. There's going to be more of a realization that the risk is there and that it needs to be planned for. Right. So on this subject of planning for risk effectively and the short-term thinking that might dominate and lead us to bad decisions, I want to talk about some of your local government clients. How do you get local governments that you work with to focus on challenges that face a city or a region, whatever, 50 years down the line, 100 years down the line, when the people in charge are worried about getting reelected two years from now or four years from now? It's actually a much easier conversation really? <laughs> on, the, on the local government side in that fundamentally, and we, we don't interact with local officials, but thankfully there are plenty of responsible visionary local officials that understand that their role and their legacy go beyond their, uh -huh. their election cycle. Um, but also working with people who are in the bureaucracy at the local level and they have the long range view because they're not getting kicked out of their job in two years. Um, so cities are very concerned uh, over climate change, certainly it's true in California. They also now are facing uh, regulatory requirements in California to plan for climate change, incorporate climate change into local hazard mitigation plans, um, into general plans. and so. They are very eager and hungry for this data and for this type of analysis. The problem is resources. And so it ties back a little bit to how do you make that a priority such right. that resources are allocated how to this issue. How do you take those tax dollars and right. put it towards something that will benefit their great grandchildren yes. perhaps? Well, and that's true of every any kind of infrastructure investment as well. And we all know that 
infrastructure is a major issue. We haven't <laughs> issue done great with that. Because <laughs> exactly, bad track record. <laughs> um, so, I, but I, I think, so that the, the main issue really is funding. And right now we're talking not a lot of funding because we're just talking about funding to understand what's going on, to start making plans, the big funding, which is maybe doing some bigger projects, retrofitting, asset uh, analysis, the, the asset uh, work, build a seawall, you name it. Right. Th this, this is real money and that money is not there right now. Right. Um, so it's going to have to come and it's going to be through the usual means of bonds and right. maybe some private investment if there's revenues attached to. Uh, so there is a lot of work. Um, there is a little bit of work that's being very innovative in terms of looking at what are the ways that we can fund some of those resilience projects um, that won't necessarily that bring new sources of capital to the table mm -hmm. uh, instead of just a bond or, or, um, or a loan. And so looking at, there's a great example in New Jersey of uh, an underground parking lot. So it's a parking lot, it makes money, except when there is a big storm coming and they think they're gonna have a major flood issue, the cars need to get out and it acts as a storage mm -hmm. for uh, extra water. So there's a lot of ideas like that on what are ways that we can find to bring this extra capital to the table because we know the cities don't have it. Right. Um, so are most of your clients, local government clients, the sort of folks who are going to be building a seawall sometime soon? Or do you also serve clients who are inland and dealing with other kinds of climate change impacts? So thankfully, it's not all about seawalls yeah. because we would have a problem. I mean, floods are a major issue. There's different ways to deal with floods. Um, we work with clients both in and out. Uh, on the coastline, we worked with the city of San Francisco and helped them map um, not just floods, but how floods were going to affect health impacts specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, in here in Alameda County, we've worked with eight cities, helping them understand different type of hazards. Who are also looking at wildfire for some of those um, East Bay cities. We've worked with the city of Denver. We're working with the state of California on heat-related risk, and heat is a major issue for most of the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, because the parts that are already hot are going to get so hot that it's going to be really dangerous to human health every now and then. And the parts of the U.S. that are not so hot right now, like the California coast, the Pacific Northwest, are going to get hot enough that they would really like to have AC, and hmm. they don't have AC. Wow. And then, of course, it creates all kind of issues if everybody starts having AC and with impacts right. on emissions and energy demand. So heat is a really, really big, it's heat and floods. Are would big. you say that heat is one of the areas where cities are least prepared? What, what are the top areas where local governments need to be doing more or don't realize yet that they have a major problem? It really depends on cities. In, in California for the past four years, we were only talking about water scarcity and the drought and a little bit about heat and now everybody's talking about floods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, going into the Midwest or the uh, northeast, massive increase in precipitation is what they're faced with. So they're not so worried about water scarcity or even about heat right now in the southeast, in the Pacific Northwest. They're much more worried about heat. So I don't think there's a, there's a playbook. It's just taking the time to look at the impacts, not just on physical assets, but also on the community, health impacts, and other policy impacts is what cities need to do. And, and, but even that is a, is a challenge in the first place. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, not a lot of GSPP grads end up CEO of their own company. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very cool, but also atypical. Um, you spent your first five years out of Goldman uh, as a policy analyst, fairly standard you know, choice. I think a lot of us have made something like that, a choice like that. What was your thought process as you ended the, near the end of those five years and you were thinking, maybe I'm ready to take this big, unusual step? Yes. I <laughs> I really wanted to work for the government. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of Goldman students exactly. work for the government. Exactly. I that was hard. so ready to take on my job as a policy analyst in a uh, in an agency. I am not. I was not at the time a U.S. citizen. I am now, and uh, I was moving to D.C. And you may not work for the government when you're not a U.S. citizen in D.C. So I was moving to D.C. for personal reasons yeah. to follow my GSPP husband <laughs> <laughs> who really wanted to work for the federal government. Uh -huh. Anyway, so uh, I, I worked as a policy analyst in a private research uh, firm and 
was helping businesses and private organizations understand the impact of certain policy decisions around climate policy and carbon markets, which by the way, carbon markets, GSPP, <laughs> market mechanisms, I mean, it all comes together in the end. Um, so I was helping translating policy into business signals and found that I actually really enjoy that. And also my experience working in uh, large agencies had told me that maybe I was not made to work in a big bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So I knew that. <laughs> and um, when climate policy went down the drain uh, for the, the previous time that it went down the drain, I decided that it was time to work on climate impacts and adaptation. And so I started looking for my next job, saying I'm going to do this. I'm going to translate climate science. Uh -huh. In, in a policy context for businesses and found that nobody was doing that. Yeah. And so I just figured I was going to do it. How does a Goldman education, if at all, uh, teach you about running a business? Or what does it, how does it prepare you for running a business and managing a staff? So what it did not prepare me for, but there's other ways to learn that, actually, through UC Extension is what I did, really? uh, was you know the accounting and the management. but. You can learn this stuff on the fly. It. Um, what it gave me that I think is very uh, unique and is part of our value proposition is really strong analytical skills, the ability to look at quantitative models and extract meaning out of it that is useful to people who make real life decisions, um, the ability to visualize findings in mm. a way that's compelling and that is true to the meaning of the underlying data and models, and, and the sort of the 360 policy, legal, understanding how all the different pieces fit together between the economy, the politics, the administrative element, the legal pieces, and how those all come together. And so we do have uh, a branch that does policy consulting in my, in my company, but I think some of the value add that I bring personally sitting in between my business clients and my wonky scientist team is the ability to, to help them talk to each other and, uh, and tell my team, I have no idea what you just told me, so I'm pretty sure a client won't understand it either. Right, right. <laughs> so let's work on this. Right. And so bringing that high level strategic view rather than uh, than being too deep in the data. We talked with um, a different guest about how GSPP trains blenders. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a whole bunch of people who are equipped to do economics and law and policy and you know whatever else it may be. Um, and when you're trying to translate across fields and across sectors and across types of people, uh, the blender. That's, the, that's the a great the description. Person. Well, and the mission focused and the, the desire and willingness to s spend your life trying to make the world a better that's place. Right. <laughs> it is that a too. commonality. That too. Um, um, public oriented, publicly oriented blenders. I think <laughs> something, I, we have to workshop this. We're not really the messaging team around here. <laughs> this has been lovely, Emily. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining In the Arena. 